Good evening, family. Good evening. How are you folks doing tonight? Amen. Praise God. Happy to be here? Good. Yes. Perhaps for some of you it was a challenge to get here tonight, but I believe that just in showing up is victory in and of itself. Amen. For in places like this, the devil works hard to stop us from coming. He works overtime, throws many distractions, and he gives us many reasons or excuses for not coming. But praise God that we're here tonight, and God has promised us a special blessing, and I promise under the authority of God's word that we are not going to be disappointed. Amen? Amen. We serve a God that is able to deliver, and uh, he knows what we need, just what we need. Today I've been studying this message all day, and I believe that God has given me a message. It's a very important message. A message that points us to our place of safety in Christ. It's a very intricate message. Lots of details. And we're going to be studying theology tonight. But I promise it's going to be practical at the same time. Not just theoretical. But practical. And I'm very excited about it. It's entitled Watch the Lamb. As we've been meeting night after night in this week of revival. Uh, we learned that that word revival. It means what? Do you remember? To live again. And so to call for revival is to recognize and acknowledge that we are dead and that only Christ can make us alive. To call for revival is to come to the point in our experience where we're not satisfied with the empty routine of just being a systematic Christian, but we want a living relationship with the living God. A relationship that is vibrant, full of life, full of the life of Christ in us. And we learned that there are two things that bring revival, two things that awaken us from spiritual death and from, the, uh, the, the, from being stagnant, from being spiritually asleep. What are the two things that bring revival? Do you remember? Prayer. Prayer and prophetic study. And that's what we'll be doing this past week, and I hope that you've been doing it at home as well. This past week, as we meet the meeting night tonight, we've been studying prophetic messages, not just ordinary messages. But messages that will bring the latter rain if we would receive it. We talked about the importance of having oil, extra oil, amen? Remember that? In our vessels with our lamps, we saw that that was very important because there's a midnight crisis that is about to take place. Now we learned that that midnight crisis, do you remember what that midnight time is? It is the passing, it's the final test that God's people will, will be brought face to face with. It is the past of a national Sunday law, the only way that we can continue to burn and be on fire for Christ during that time is if we have the extra oil of what? Of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. We talked about the importance of having that Holy Spirit. We also talked about the importance of being watchmen in the last days and how God is calling us to be watchmen. And as watchmen, we're to... Point out the danger to give people the warning, but also to point people to the place of safety. Isn't that right? And we also talked last night about the final gathering that is going to take place. As Satan is gathering the world under his deceptions and delusions, God is gathering his people under the banner of truth and righteousness. And that we need to seek that more now more than ever before because we see indeed that now is a, it is a high time to awake out of sleep, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. All the signs are pointing to the fact that Jesus is truly coming soon. And, 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 and the reason why He's not yet come, it's not as, as if we are waiting for Him to come, but He is waiting for us to come. Jesus is ready. The question is, are we coming? And, and so, in light of that, I'm so thankful that you came tonight seeking a deeper experience. Seeking to come up higher in your walk with Christ. And it's my prayer that we would not just be readers and hearers of God's word. That, but we would be doers and followers as well. Can you say that? Amen. Very, very important. Tonight, we're going to repeat and enlarge on some of the things that we've been studying in this past week. Our message is watch the Lamb. And uh, before we get into that message, uh, I just have a, a quick announcement you know, my wife and I, we get the, uh, the privilege of traveling different places, doing meetings like this, revivals and weeks of prayer and weekend revivals and seminars. And uh, this coming uh, May and June, we're actually going to be going to the uh, country of Malaysia and Thailand.
Thailand. And uh, we're going to be going there preaching in uh, three or four different places. Now, I don't know if you know anything about that area of the world, but Malaysia and Thailand is, is a place where, where there's a big absence of Christianity. Muslim uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Buddhist countries. It's in the 1040 window where it's very, uh, most people are of other religions. And so we want to ask that you please keep us in prayer as we prepare for those, uh, that special meeting. My wife and I uh, are getting a chance to go there and uh, to help to f uh, raise funds for that trip. Uh, on your way out tonight, we have some pictures, uh, photography, nature photography, as well as some uh, DVDs and CDs and uh, for purchase and, and uh, everything that all the funds are going to go to help support that specific mission trip. And so pray about it, think about it. If you'd like to support us, it would be much appreciated. But the most important thing that we need is prayer that God will keep us safe and that he would fill us with his spirit. And so how many of you are committed to pray for us? Amen. Really, really, really appreciate that. So my message, watch the Lamb. I invite you to buy with this video with prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your great love and mercy. It is of your mercy that we're not consumed. Your compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that despite our unfaithfulness, you are faithful. Despite our inconsistencies, you remain consistent in your love towards us. And Father, even though we've fallen short of your glory, we've made mistakes and we've sinned against you. Thank you, Lord, that you've never given up on us. And that the work that you've started in our lives, you've promised that you were able to finish it. And tonight, dear Jesus, as we study about how you finish the work, how you are the perfecter of our faith, we pray that the Holy Spirit will give us a good understanding. But more than just a good understanding, give us a powerful experience with what we are seeking to understand tonight. Father, I know that this message, I've been studying it all day today, but I need your Holy Spirit to give me the words. To make it plain, to make it clear, and that we might see Jesus in this message. So please, Lord, hide me behind the cross, and may Jesus be seen this evening as we watch the Lamb take away the sin of this world. Bless us now, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like you to open with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. As we begin tonight, we're going to the book of Luke, chapter 21. We read this last night. We want to read it again because, as I mentioned, we're going to simply repeat and enlarge tonight. So notice with me, Luke, what chapter are we going to? And Luke 21 is about the signs of the times. Describes what it's going to be like at the end of time. It describes a world of natural disasters. Moral decay, political corruption, international unrest, wars and rumors of wars. In short, it's describing the world that we live in. The world that is about to see the second coming of Christ. And in this context, Jesus said in Luke 21, beginning with verse 27. If you're there and if you're ready to study, would you please say amen? amen. Jesus said, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look in what direction? Look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. Jesus says clearly in this passage, in the context of His soon coming in the clouds of heaven, that when we see these things begin to come to pass, what are these things that he's referring to? We talked about it last time. Contextually, these things are the signs that are taking place at the end of time. And as we see these signs being fulfilled before our very eyes, as we see these things, Jesus makes it clear that he does not want us to focus on these things. 
But he wants us to look where? To look up. In other words, as watchmen, God is calling us, yes, to look around so that we might see the sign because we are to give the warning to others of what's taking place around us. But don't focus on the signs. Look up and focus on the Savior. Can you say that? And friends, even more specifically, the context of this, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples, these things that he was referring to were signs of the coming destruction. The abomination of desolation that would take place that would lead to the total desolation of the city of Jerusalem. These things, the coming destruction, is what points us to the coming deliverance that is about to take place after the destruction is over. And as watchmen, we're called to watch these things in order to give the warning. And friends, in Old Testament times, the watchmen were stationed on the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And they would look out horizontally. They would look out what direction? Horizontally. To see if destruction would come. Because these watchmen stationed on the walls of the city of Jerusalem were responsible for the safety of those within the walls. They were to look out. They were to look around. They were to look horizontally to watch for danger and destruction so that they might be able to warn the people. And friends, this is the context of what Jesus is talking about in the last days. You see, just before Jerusalem was destroyed in the year AD 70, God had some watchmen that gave solemn warnings to warn the people. In fact, there was one specifically that is spoken of in the book Great Controversy, and I want to share it with you by way of introduction. When Jerusalem was about to be destroyed in AD 70, God had a watchman that gave strong warning. Notice what he did in the book Great Controversy, page 30. It says, for seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. His warning cry ceased not until he was what? Well, slain in the siege that he had foretold. Now stop right there. You remember that the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem during AD 70 and the signs that would lead up to it was simply a microcosm, a, an object lesson of the greater destruction of the world and the signs that would lead up to the second coming of Christ. You remember the parable we talked about it before? And so here we see that there was a watchman and he went for seven years before the destruction and the siege of Jerusalem. He went warning the people and his cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. But then notice the very next sentence says, Not one Christian what? perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, did this watchman perish in the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes or no? But then it says, Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem, which shows us something that is so solemn, friends. He was a watchman, but he wasn't a Christian. He gave the message, and yet he himself was lost. The messenger was lost, friends. And so it tells us that it's not good enough for us to know the signs. We have to know the Savior. Can you say that? It's not good enough for us to just look at a horizontal level. Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, look up. In a vertical direction. Why? It's not enough for us to know the signs. We have to know the Savior. It's not enough for us to know what the beast is doing. We have to know what the Lamb is doing. Not enough for us to know what, who Antichrist is. We have to know who, the, who Jesus Christ is. Can you say amen? He was a watchman, but he wasn't a Christian. Evidently, he knew the signs, but not the Savior. Yes, brothers and sisters, we must, we must watch the signs. We must look horizontally in order to give the warning. But we need to look at something else that is more important in order to receive the blessing. What are we called to watch in these last days? Once again, Jesus said, Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws nigh. Friends, when we look around, we get depressed. But when we look up, we can be at rest. Can you say amen? amen? 
And that's why it's so important to look up, and that's what we want to do. On the, in the past few nights, we've talked about what's taking place around us in our world, and we've seen very clearly, as we've compared prophecy with current events, that we're living in the last days. But now, let us turn our attention upon what's taking place in heaven. Watchmen are to look not only horizontally, but vertically. Not only what's around, but what's up above. Look up, but the question is, what's up? What's up? What is up that enables us to receive the redemption that is drawn here? I want us to turn down our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, as we ask the question, what's up? What is up that we're to gaze upon in these last days? Hebrews, chapter 12. We're laying a foundation for a study tonight that I think you will be thoroughly blessed by. Luke, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, and when you get there, would you let me know by saying amen? amen. What's up that enables us to receive this wonderful redemption? Hebrews 12 and verse 1 is a very familiar verse, but let's look at it with new eyes tonight. Hebrews 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us let us do what? Run how? With patience, what's another word for patience? Endurance, the race that is set before us. Now it says, since we're compassed with a great cloud of witnesses. Now friends, where are the clouds? What direction? And in order for us to see the cloud of witnesses, where, do, where, where must we look? We must look up. And as we consider that we're compassed with such a greater cloud of witnesses, as we think about the prophets and apostles that have gone before us, and how our world is a lesson book of the entire universe, as we look up, it enables us to run the race. Salvation in this passage is like it unto a race, and many of us have had a good beginning, but it does not matter so much how we begin, what matters is how we're going to end the race. Can you say amen? Just like that watchman in Jerusalem, he had a good beginning, he was given the warning, he was speaking the words of God, but he himself was lost in the siege that he himself preached about. Good beginnings must turn to glorious endings, and we're going to see that God is in the business of doing just that. You see, the race can only be finished by persevering faith. It says, let us run with patience, endurance, or perseverance, this race can only be finished by this type of faith. But the question is, how do we get a faith that endures to the end? The next verse tells us, chapter 12, verse 2 now. It says, looking unto Jesus. And when we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see that he is the author and the finisher of what though? Of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and had sat down at the right hand of the what? throne of God. And so I want you to notice very carefully with me this verse. We are called to look up, to look at Jesus, and when we look at him, what do we see about Christ? We see that he is the author and the finisher of what? Faith. But also when we look at him, we see one that has endured the cross and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when we look up, we turn our attention upon the cross and the throne. The author and the finisher. Now, what does that mean when it says that Jesus is the finisher of our faith? If you are to look up that word finisher in the original language, the more accurate translation is perfecter. He's the one that has begun, and he is the one that perfects our faith, finishes our faith, matures our faith. And if you look up that word perfecter, it literally means this. One who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and so set before us the highest example of faith. When we look at Jesus, we see the perfect example of faith. He is the author and the finisher or perfecter of our faith. And so what we're seeing here, friends, is that this verse is telling us where to watch. 
We're to watch the man to see how we can have an enduring faith that enables us to run the race. In other words, friends, we need to watch the faith of Jesus. Can you say that? This text is pointing us to the faith of Jesus, but in which two places specifically? Who endured the cross, despising the shame, and had sat down at the right hand of the... So we're to look at the faith of Jesus, at the cross, and at the where again? At the throne. Friends, keep that in mind. And friends, I'm emphasizing this because you're going to see that everything is connected. Everything is essential in this message. So this text is pointing us to look at the faith of Jesus at the cross and at the throne. Because when we look at Jesus at the cross and the throne, it actually teaches us how He begins and ends our faith. When we look at the cross, we see that He's the author. When we look at the throne, we see that He is the perfecter of our faith. Now remember, watchmen are called to make it plain. Isn't that right? We read that verse in the book of Habakkuk. It says, make it plain that he that readeth may run. In order for us to run the race and finish the race, we have to make it plain the fact that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. But here's the question, friends. What makes plain the way in which we are to run? What makes plain the faith of Jesus. The Bible tells us, friends, in Psalm 77, verse 13, write it down. Psalm 77, verse 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You see, friends, the thing that makes plain the way to run is found in the sanctuary. It says, Thy way, O God, the, the path of faith, the way to run, where is it found? It is, it is illustrated for us in the sanctuary, friends, because when we look into the sanctuary, we see the way of a finished faith. We see a beginning, the author, but we also see an ending. Now I want us to notice. Next question. In the sanctuary, where does our faith begin and where does it end? First of all, who is the one that begins and ends our faith? It is Jesus. And the sanctuary illustrates it. You know why? Because Jesus is the sanctuary. Everything in the sanctuary points to Christ. Remember Jesus said, destroy this temple and three days I will raise it up. What was he referring to? Not the literal temple there in Jerusalem. He was talking about himself. He is the temple. He's the embodiment of the temple. And so when we when we talk about this Old Testament temple, it's all about Christ. Now the question is, if Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, and if His way is found in the sanctuary, in relation to this sanctuary, where does faith begin, and where does faith come to an end? We don't have to guess, because the Bible gives us a very clear answer in the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Please turn with me now. Hebrews chapter 5, we're moving step by step through this study. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 5, we're trying to find out where in the sanctuary does faith begin and where does it end? Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 5, if you're there, would you please say amen? amen. The Bible says, Hebrews 5, 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we see that Jesus is our high priest. Can you say that? He's not only the lamb, but he's also the high priest. But here's the question. What made Jesus a faithful high priest? What was it that made Jesus a faithful high priest? The next verse. Verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, what does that mean? In the days that Jesus was incarnated in the flesh, the days that Christ was walking upon this world, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, he'd offered up what? Prayers. But when is he doing this? In the days of his flesh. Jesus many times was found praying. So it's talking about Jesus praying when he was a man. Now notice it continues. When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and what? 
tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Now friends, when exactly is this talking about? When was it that Jesus, in the days of his flesh, was praying to his Father with strong cries and tears? He was agonizing with God, the one that could save him from death. What was it that he was asking to be, to be rescued from death? What was that? The garden of his son. Jesus in that garden, in the days of his flesh, with prayers and tears, he was suffering in the garden, and he was asking, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He was talking to the only one that can save him from the death that he was about to face. And so we see Jesus. He's praying. He did not feel like dying for us. The weight of the world's sins was crushing the life out of him. My sin and your sin was so heavy, he felt like he couldn't go through it. And so, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He's praying. This is what verse 7 is referring to. Are you with me, yes or no? So remember, what was the question? What, would, what made Jesus a faithful high priest? Answer in the day of his flesh, in the garden of Gethsemane, as he's praying to God, he's asking for deliverance from death. Then notice what the rest of the verse says. Verse 7, the last part, it says, with strong cries and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was what? Heard. Was his prayer heard? Yes or no? Yes. Why was it heard? In that he, in that he what? He feared, my version says. And so we see that the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was heard by God. Why? Because he feared God. What does that mean, he feared God? Reverential submission to God. You see, in, when Jesus was in the Garden, praying that God would save him from death, letting the cup pass, Jesus did not demand that his will would be done because he feared God. He put his Father's will above his will and he concluded that prayer by saying, Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. That prayer was heard, friends. How was it heard? Did God rescue him from death? Yes or no? No, but how was that prayer heard? God gave him strength to continue to endure. Which shows, brothers and sisters, that God does not always give us what we want. But he always gives us what we need. Can you say Even for Christ. Why? Because he did not demand for his will to be done. He said, God, this is my desire. But my desire is in subjection to your will. May your will be done. That prayer was heard. Not that God gave him what he wanted. But he gave him what he needed. The strength to drink the cup for you and for me. And for that, I am thankful. Can you say that? Now notice what happens now in verse 8. It says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he wrote. So as a result of that prayer, he was able to learn obedience. He became obedient unto death. He was able to suffer for the sins of the whole world. As by submissive prayer, he became obedient unto death. Now what happened as a result of his death on the cross? Verse 9. It says, And being made perfect, he became the, what is that word? The what? The author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So remember, what's the question? We're trying to find out, where does faith begin in the sanctuary? And to answer that, we just have to ask, well, when did Jesus become the author of our faith? When did Jesus become the author of our faith? It's right here, friends. When he surrendered himself on the cross for our sins. Can you say that? In Gethsemane, he drank the cup. And he went through suffering. Now, because of that, he is able to become our high priest, a faithful high priest, because he can sympathize with us, being made perfect. That means as he completed the task in dying for us, because he was made perfect, or because he drank the cup and completed the task, we, brothers and sisters, are now, our faith is authored by him. In other words, here's the point. Because Jesus finished an earthly ministry, we can have now 
a heavenly experience. Can you say that? <laughs> this is how Jesus becomes the author of our faith. And friends, where does Jesus become the finisher of our faith? You see, He became our author, the author of our faith, when dying upon the cross, but He becomes the finisher of our faith when blotting out our sins in the most holy place. That's why Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the... The what? Because after the cross, He authors our faith, but where does He finish it? But after that, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And where is the throne of God in the sanctuary? In 1844, it moved into the most holy place. And that's why, friends, Jesus is called the beginning and the end. Can you say that? The beginning and the end. Now, these two events, the cross and the throne, what happened when Jesus died on Calvary, and what's happening right now in the most holy place at the throne of God, these two events are intimately connected together. Notice now what it says in the Great Controversy, page 489. It says, The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as well. Essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the Cross. So do you see, friends, what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary above, in the most holy place, at the throne of God, is as essential for salvation as what He did upon the cross. Why? Notice. By His death, He began. He authored that work, which after His resurrection, He ascended to complete, or what is the number for complete? Finish. Where? In heaven. Do you see the connection? Yes or no? Then it says, we must by faith enter within the veil, whether the forerunner is entered for us. Where is in the veil? That's the most holy place. And when we go into the most holy place, where Jesus is at the throne of God, interceding for us, it says, there the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. And there, that is in the most holy place, we may gain a what kind of insight? an even clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. Friends, there is something in the most holy place that gives us an even clearer picture of the plan of redemption than what the cross does. They're both important. They're both connected. Why? Because at the cross, He began a good work in us, but in the most holy place, He actually finishes the work in us at the throne of God. And so where are we to watch? We are to look up, to lift up our heads in the most holy place specifically where our redemption draws near. Can you say that? Now here's the next question as we move step by step. What happens in the most holy place that makes redemption even clearer? Friends, we're going to see tonight that in the most holy place, that's where Jesus takes away our sins forever. He completely blots them out for eternity. And in doing so, He finishes the work that He has begun in our hearts that took place when we came to the cross of Christ. Now you remember John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one that prepared the way for the first advent of Messiah. And one of his main messages in John chapter 1 verse 29, write it down. John the Baptist said, Behold, what does that word behold mean? To look or watch. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? Sin. The sin of the world. And so friends, the message tonight is watch the Lamb. Watch the Lamb do what? Watch the Lamb take away the sin of the world. Not just cover the sin of the world. Not just forgive the sin of the world, but actually He takes it away and He blots it out forever. Watch the Lamb. And so here's the next question. How does the Lamb remove sin? How does the Lamb of God take away the sin of the world? How does He complete our faith? There are two things that must happen. Two things 
things must happen for sin to be removed from the record in heaven and from our lives here on earth. How many things? Two things that the Lamb has to do in order to take away our sins. Not just legally from the records in heaven, but experimentally as it removes it from our lives. How many things again? Two things. What is the first one? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. The Bible says clearly that without shedding of blood, there is no one. What is that word? Remission. Forgiveness. And that was the first thing that needed to take place in order for the Lamb to take away the sin of the world is that His blood, His pure, innocent blood had to be shed. Where does this take place? On the cross. And in relation to the sanctuary, I wish I had a slide, I should put this for the next time. Where is the cross in relation to the sanctuary? It is the altar of sacrifice. Remember, how many compartments does the sanctuary have? There are three compartments. Two in the main building, but there are actually three. The first one is the outer court. The second one is the holy place. And the third is the most holy place. And so when a sinner wanted to be forgiven, he would bring a lamb first to where? The outer court. And as he enters into the, into the courts of God, as he goes to the, 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 test, the temple, the first thing as he enters into the gate, into the outer court, the first thing his eyes lay on is what? The first article of furniture is the altar of burnt offering. At that altar, the animal sacrifice was slain and consumed by fire. And friends, that altar represents Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that was consumed by the fires of our sin. You see, as we enter into the sanctuary, the first thing we see, the thing that authors our faith, is that altar which symbolizes the cross. That's where the blood was what? That's where the blood was shed. And so, how many things must take place in order for the Lamb to take away sin? First one, blood has to be shed. And where in the sanctuary did that take place? At the altar burnt offering, which represents the cross. Notice the second thing that had to be do, had to be done. It's found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, and verse 11. Write it down. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the what? In the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So two things. Number one, the blood had to be shed, but number two, it had to be given, or in other words, it had to be applied. It had to be what? You see, just because Jesus shed his blood does, does not mean that every sinner in this world is going to be saved, friends. Blood shed has no power in our lives until it is received by us, or until it is applied to us. Until it is what? Applied to us. So two things. Number one, blood had to be shed. And then number two, blood had to be applied to us individually and personally in order for sin to be removed from our lives. And if that's clear, let me hear you say amen. So blood shed and blood applied. And friends, after the blood was shed, where was it shed again? In, in the sanctuary? At the altar of burnt offering? But where was it applied to our account? It was applied in the sanctuary and on the Day of Atonement, specifically in the most holy place at the throne of God. Where was the blood shed and where was it applied in relation to the sanctuary? We just talked about that. So here's the slide as I catch up with myself. The blood was shed right there at the altar burnt offerings. But then the priest would take the blood on the Day of Atonement. He would go into the most holy place. He would sprinkle that blood upon the mercy seat, upon the Ark of the Covenant. And that blood would, uh, would be applied to our account. And that act of applying the blood is what blotted out sin forever. This, friends, is how the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Are you with me, yes or no? Now, friends, just as the first forerunner of the first coming of Christ, who was that? Just as John the Baptist 
pointed people to watch the lamb that would take away the sin of the world. He would point people to the sacrifice of Christ, so to the final forerunners at the end of time. Those whom God has chosen to prepare the way for the second advent of Christ, they too, like John the Baptist, the first forerunner, is also going to point people to watch the Lamb, not only as He begun a good work in our lives at the cross, but as He takes away sin from the record that is in the most holy place. The final forerunners will do the exact same thing that the first forerunner did, but yet they will go even the next step and point people to what is taking place in heaven. Remember, Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, look up. Why? What's up? When we look up, we see Jesus, the Lamb, the High Priest, taking away the sin of the world as He blots it out from the sanctuary above. above. We see the Lamb of God that shed His blood on the cross. We see Him now applying His shed blood upon the record of our lives in the most holy place in the heavenly judgment that is taking place right now since the year 1844. And this is where the God's end time watchmen are going to point people to. Because friends, listen, it is there that our faith is completed. Remember looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher. Why look into the most holy place? Because that's where Jesus actually finishes and completes and perfects our faith. And so we're going to point people to go to that place. You know why? Because it's also the only place of safety in these last days. Notice what it says in Psalms 91 verses 1 to 4. Write it down. Psalms 91, friends, is a psalm for us in the last days. It applies to every generation, but it applies to our generation more than any other generation. It describes the place of safety, the only place of safety, when all hell breaks loose in the time of trouble in the last days. Notice what it says. Psalms 91, verse 1 to 4, it says, He that dwells where? In the secret place of the Most High. Friends, where is that? We're going to find out. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of who? The Almighty. So the secret place of the Most High is where the Almighty dwells. And God calls us to dwell there by faith. Then it says, I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowl and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So in the time when the pestilences, when the plagues, when the time of trouble takes place, the only place of safety here in these last days is under his feathers and under his wings. The secret place of the Most High is under the wings of God. Now does that mean that God has some literal wings and we're hiding under literal wings? Friends, that's sanctuary language. For in the most holy place, above the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels. Their wings were spread out. And in between or under those wings dwelt the Shekinah glory, the visible manifestation of the glory of God. And so what this is doing, friends, it is pointing us to the most holy place to be covered under his feathers and under his wings is to abide right there where the Shekinah glory abides. And friends, we must go there because that's the Ark of Safety. The Ark of the Covenant is our Ark of Safety. We're living in a time when another flood of fire is about to take place in our world. Can you see that? And so God's watchmen, they look up because they see that that is the place of safety. And they point people, remember, the watchmen, they not only point out the danger that is around, but they point to the place of safety, which is above. Amen. I want to be that watchman, how about you? Amen. But friends, if we don't know what's taking place above, we won't know where to point people to. And so, the watchman gives the warning, but points to the place of safety. And the reason why this is so important in the last days because Satan is out there to get us and if we don't have a city of refuge if we're not abiding in the secret place of the Most High we are easy prey for the enemy notice how the Bible describes it in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 
Please write it down. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your who? Adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Here we find, friends, that it is important to make sure that we have a safe place. Because there's a lion who is the adversary, Satan himself, he's walking about and he's roaring. And he's trying to find people whom he can devour. And friends, let me make it clear tonight that the roar of the lion is none other than the accusations of the adversary. Now friends, when it says that word advers adversary, it's a legal word. It talks about one who is uh, opposing you in a court of law. In other words, another word for adversary is one who accuses. One who does what? Accuses us before God. And it says that we, uh, as Satan is roaring and accusing us, the only place of safety is in the secret place of the Most High. It is in the most holy place. Because friends, we're going to see tonight that in the most holy place, that's where Jesus silences the roar of the lion. The accusations of Satan. There's good news, friends. Even though the lion... Lion's roar is so fearful and afraid and, and, and scary. All he can do is roar. He's a lion with no teeth, friends. <laughs> Jesus knocked his teeth out on the cross. Amen. Amen. All he can do is roar. All he can do is try to scare you. But he, there is no bite in his bark or his roar. And the Bible tells us that the thing that slays the lion is the Lamb. The Lamb of life has the power to destroy the lion of lies. Can you see amen? Yeah. You see, in this great controversy, the roar of the lion, there are two main components to it. Two main accusations of Satan. How many? And friends, don't lose me, friend. Uh, everything is connected. You're going to see in a moment. I'm going to tie it all in together. In this great controversy between good and evil, in the last days especially, Satan has two main accusations. And both of these accusations are settled and silenced in two different places. Guess where? The first one is settled and silenced at the cross. The second one is settled and silenced at the throne in the most holy place. Now let me unpack that for you tonight. What was Satan's initial accusation? What was the first roar of the lion? What was his first accusation? Desire of Ages. Page 761, it tells us. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan, in, in the what? In other words, when the controversy first began, this was Satan's first accusation. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the what? The law of God could not be Obey that justice that what yes. was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, was the law broken by man? Yes, or no? yes. yes. And so Satan's claim: Should the law be broken, it would be impossible. It would be what? Impossible for the sinner to be pardoned or forgiven. Every sin Satan claimed must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit, what is another word for remit? Pardon. To pardon or to forgive or to have mercy. Satan said that if God should remit the punishment of sin, which is, what is the punishment of sin? Yes. Death. He would not be a God of what? Truth and justice. So the first roar of the line, the first accusation of Satan was that God's justice was inconsistent with mercy. And that if the law was broken, then the sinner that broke the law must die. And it was impossible for God to be a merciful God. In other words, Satan's first accusation, God, in fact, let me read the whole verse. Whole, whole, whole. It says, when men broke the law of God and defiled his will, Satan exalted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed. And that man could not be forgiven. That God could not have mercy on man. Legally, God, you can't have mercy without compromising your justice. Because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven, 
Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be, what is that word? Just the urge, and yet show mercy to the sinner. So listen very carefully, friends. The first accusation of Satan is that God's justice and God's mercy are incompatible, inconsistent. In other words, Satan was accusing God of being inconsistent in his character. Friends, the two main characteristics of God is that he is merciful and just at the same time. God's mercy and God's justice are two sides of the same coin. God is 100% merciful and 100% justice at the very same time. These two things don't go against each other. They, they are compatible with each other. But Satan's argument, he was saying, God, you're not who you really say you are. You're not a God of justice nor a God of mercy. And then he said, man had broken the law. Therefore, he must die. And if he must die, therefore you cannot have mercy. You're not a merciful God. If you hold on to your justice, you have to let go of your mercy, is what Satan urged. Are you with me, yes or no? You're not a merciful and loving God. Sinful man must die. Justice must be served. An eternal law was broken. An eternal price must be paid. And you can't have mercy on them, God. Just as I was banished from heaven, these, the, the human race, must be banished from your love. You're not a merciful God. You're not a loving God. You claim to be love, but you're not love. Now, here's the question. Do you understand the accusation? Yes or no? Yes. Here's the question. How would God prove? Now, before we get to that, was the accusation true or false? It was false because Satan is the father of all lies. But how was God going to prove that it was false? How would God prove that he is a merciful God without laying aside or compromising his justice. How would he do it? How could he hold to one and hold to the other at the same time? How could God be just and merciful simultaneously? Oh friends, the answer is beautiful. <clears throat> Jesus is the answer. He knows what to do, friends, when we're in trouble. Can you say that? <laughs> Satan was... Uh, he was on to something. But he didn't know himself the beauty of the character of God. And so how would God be just and merciful at the same time? By his life and his death. Christ, what is that word? Proved to who? To Satan and to the whole universe. Christ proved that God's what? Justice did not destroy his mercy. But that sin could be forgiven. And that the law is righteous. And can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. And God had given man unmistakable evidence of his love. Friends, tell me, how did God prove that he is merciful and justice at the same time? By living a perfect life. And then die a death that he did not deserve to die. You see, at the cross, brothers and sisters, Christ proved to Satan the absolute consistency of his own character. Jesus' death, brothers and sisters, Jesus dies to satisfy the justice of the broken law. You see, the law was broken, yes or no? Yes. And the law demanded death, yes or no? Yes. The sinner must die in order for God to be just. And God, instead of just pardoning man, He instead would take man's place and by His death, He would satisfy the justice of the broken law. But at the very same time of dying and satisfying justice, He was offering mercy and pardon and forgiveness to the sinful human race. Can you see that? He was able to be just and merciful. In fact, we say it like this. The only way that God could be justice and mercy at the same time was to do exactly what he did. To die in the place of fallen humanity. And the reason why he can't give mercy is because he was the innocent one that died in place of the guilty. Friends, this is the mystery of redemption. If we try to explain it, we might lose our mind, but if we don't believe it, we'll lose our soul. Can you see that? And we may not be able to fully comprehend it, but we can experience it by the grace of God. 
So sinful man must die. Justice must be served. You are not a merciful God. You're not a loving God. Jesus proves it by dying, satisfying justice, but showing mercy at the same time. We see the innocent God taking the place of guilty man. Justice is served and mercy is given. Christ does prove that justice does not do away with mercy and the roar of the lion is silenced. His accusations are proven false. Where did this take place? At the cross. In relation to the sanctuary, where is that? In the relation to the sanctuary, where is, where is the cross? At the altar of burnt offering. And it's that, at that cross, at that altar, that our faith is offered. It is what? Or he begins the faith. The, rock, the lion's roar of silence. Now, notice another one, just to make sure it's clear. Desire of Ages 762. God's love has God's what? Has been expressed in His justice no less than in His mercy. Justice is the foundation of His throne. Where's the throne? In the sanctuary? Most holy place. And the fruit of His love. It had been Satan's purpose to, what is that word? Divorce what? Mercy from truth and justice. Satan tries to say these two things can't go together. They're, they're separate. They're divorced. Justice and mercy are incompatible. That's what, that was his first accusation. He sought to prove that the righteousness of God's law is an enemy to peace. But Christ shows that in God's plan, they're indissolubly joined together and the one cannot exist without the other. In other words, these two things are two sides of the same coin. God's justice and God's mercy are one and the same. And the cross proves the consistency of these two characteristics of God. Can you say amen? amen. Absolute consistency of God's character of love. But you see in the Christian world, people are trying to do it exactly what Satan tried to do in the beginning. They try to say, oh, let's just preach about love. Let's not talk about the law as if the law of God and the love of God can be divorced. Not at all, friends. People emphasize greasy grace. They say, oh, let's not talk about our righteousness and the standards and, 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 and living our, a holy life. Let's just talk about the grace of God as if you can actually divorce grace and works. Friends, they are together. They're two sides of the same coin. Can you say that? Amen. Many Christian churches are doing exactly what Satan tried to do. But praise God that God would rather die than compromise his justice. And he'd rather die than not give mercy to the human race. Can you say that? Now I want us to notice. That's why the Bible says in Psalms 85 and verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The mercy of God and the truth or the justice of God have kissed. They've met together. They are one and the same. And friends, where did mercy and truth kiss? At the cross. The mercy and justice of God came together totally consistent with one another. Mercy and truth or justice met together at the cross. And because of this, brothers and sisters, listen, listen. The perfect blend of God's mercy and justice revealed at the cross, because of this, God can be just as well as the justifier of man at the same time. Friends, no matter what you've done in your life, because of Calvary, you have a legal right. A what kind of right? A legal right to the mercy of God because of the cross. You have a legal right to tap into God's grace, not because of what you have done, but because of what He has done for us on the cross. Because of that, Jesus can be the author, the beginner of our faith. And somebody ought to say amen. amen. That's not about you, but I've made mistakes. I used to be a drug addict. I used to go around and do crazy things in the world. I've caused God much pain. And Satan accused me night and day, and many of his accusations are accurate. You see, Satan has a record of the sinfulness of our lives, and he rubs our sins in our face, but he also rubs our sins in God's face. He accuses us before God, and he is right in his accusations. But praise the Lord that because of the blood of Jesus, we have a legal defense, a legal right to the mercy and grace of God. Amen. It's not because of what we have done. 
but because of what He has done. It's not because of who we are, it's because of who He is. And friends, remember, where did Jesus author our faith in the typical sanctuary service? At the altar of sacrifice. It happens at the altar of burnt offering. And at that altar, the blood was shed for our sins. But friends, listen. How many accusations did I say there were? Two. We just talked about the first one. It was settled and silenced at the cross, at this altar. But even after the cross, Satan had another accusation to throw at God and God's people. What was it? Notice. Is our ages? 762. Another deception was now to be brought forward. Satan declared that what? Mercy. Mercy what? Now he's just he's just doing the opposite. At first he said justice destroys mercy. And now he's saying that mercy destroys justice. That the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. He's saying because you died, and now because you're having mercy on sinners, by doing that, you're disregarding your justice. You're, you're, you're throwing away your law. This was his second accusation. Then he said, then it says, had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. It was because, but to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under Satan. Control. It was because the law was changed, changed this, because man could be saved only through obedience to its precepts, that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. You see, Jesus died because the law couldn't be changed. But Satan is accusing Christ, saying, you died to change your law? That's the only way that you can have mercy upon that. Take away the thing that requires death, and that's the only way that the sinner can live. Your mercy does away with justice. Are you with me, Ashanam? Then it says, Yet the very means by which Christ established the law, in this context, what was the very means that Christ established the law? By his death on the cross. Jesus died rather than change his law. He died to prove that his law and justice was consistent and unchanging. And it says, The very means by which Christ uh, established the law, that is the cross, Satan represented as... Destroying the law, the cross or grace destroys the law. Here will come the what? Last. The last conflict in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. So the last accusation, the first one, is that justice destroys mercy. The second one, your mercy now destroys justice. And friends, many people believe it. You know why? They say, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. You can sin and still go to heaven. The grace of God is so great that the grace of God will save you even though you continue to break the law of God. That's what Satan was, was, was claiming. And it's here it will come the last, uh, 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 the last conflict in the great controversy in the last days. It said to Satan is saying, your mercy and grace must do it with the law because it's impossible for imperfect man to keep a perfect law. It is what? Satan is saying it's impossible for imperfect man to keep a perfect law. And in requiring your children to obey your law, you are asking fallen man to do something that is impossible. And because of this, your mercy is laying aside your justice. You are not fair in asking man to keep a law that is perfect. This was his second accusation. And so now what Christ has to do, listen friends, now Christ must vindicate the fairness or the justness of his law. He must show that it is totally reasonable to ask man to keep the law. There's no injustice in asking man to keep the law. He must prove it because this was Satan's accusation. Christ must vindicate the fairness or justice of his law. He must demonstrate how his mercy, how his what? Mercy. Doesn't do away with the law but how His mercy enables us to, uh, to keep the law of God. Mercy doesn't do away with the law, as Satan was, was claiming. Mercy enables us to keep the law. And the question is, how would God demonstrate this, and how would He prove it to Satan and the universe? Friends, where and how does He do it? He does it at the throne. The first accusation was silenced at the cross. This second accusation is silence 
at the most holy place. The first, at the cross, he offered our faith. In the most holy place, he finishes our faith. This second accusation is set up in the most holy place. Because in the most holy place, this is where Christ perfects our faith. And it's in the most holy place we've been told that we gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. And what kind of insight? A clearer insight. You see, in the year 1844, Jesus stepped into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that's why Jesus said, look up, lift up your heads, look at me and what I am doing in these last days in my cleansing work. Because in that most holy place, the blood that was shed at the altar, the cross, is now applied to our accounts in the most holy place. Remember, friends, sin is removed by one, two things. Blood that was shed, and then number two, blood that is applied. And just like the cross, oh, friends, don't lose me, just like the cross, in the most holy place, God's justice and God's mercy meets and kisses again. Just like the cross in the most holy place, the mercy of God meets again. Friends, what do you have in the most holy place? You have one article of furniture. What is it called? The Ark of the The Ark of the Covenant was one furniture, but it had two main components. How many components? Two. It was a, the ark was a just like piece of furniture, overlaid with gold on the inside and the outside. And on the inside of the ark was the what? The law of God, which is the justice of God. It is the what? Justice. It is the standard of what is just. And that word just simply means right. It is the standard of righteousness. That's one component of the ark. But the other component was that right above the ark of the covenant, there was a there, there was a solid slab of gold that was the cover of this chest, and that solid slab of gold was called the mercy, mercy seat. Here we find justice and mercy kissing. The complete consistency of the justice and the mercy of God. It was made of solid gold. So as we look into the most holy place, we see that mercy does not do away with God's justice because the law is still there as mercy is there as well. Can you say that? Amen. Now, how besides that, does the most holy place show that mercy doesn't do away with justice? What happened in the most holy place when the blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat? What happened when the blood was applied? Two things would happen, friends. Listen very carefully. When the, when the high priest would apply the blood upon the mercy seat, number one, what happened? The blood that was shed, where was it shed? At the cross. Is applied to our account in the most holy place as Jesus covers our account with his blood. And doing so, justice is served, and our sins are, what is that word right there? Legally blotted out. In other words, the blood gives Jesus a legal right to, to, to cover the record of our sins. That's what, happened. That's what happens when Jesus would sprinkle the blood or apply the blood on the mercy seat. That's one thing that would happen, but notice the second thing. What else would happen when the high priest would sprinkle the blood in the most holy place? The pure life of Christ. The what kind of life? The sinless, pure life of Christ. And by the way, what is in the blood? The life. the life is in the blood. Whose blood was it that was applied? The blood of the Lamb. The Lamb represents Christ. And so when the blood was applied in the most holy place, the pure life of Christ, now it becomes a part of us, not just legally, but what? Experimentally. In soul. Jesus is able to perfect our faith. You see, many people believe that because of the blood that was shed on the cross, we don't have to keep the law. But here we see that the blood not only justifies us legally, but it changes us experimentally as now the life of Christ becomes our life. And as Jesus brings our lives back into harmony with his law. This happens as we watch the Lamb by faith. And some of you are thinking, is this really possible? Is this the true gospel? Is it possible to keep the law of God perfectly 
by faith. Satan says, no, no, it's not possible. God, you're not fair to require a sinful man to keep your law. Is it possible to keep the law? Is it possible to have complete victory over sin? Notice the Bible says, friends. Jude, in verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is what? Able to keep you from? Is God able? Are you able? You're not able, but is God able? Yes. Oh, He's able, friends, to keep us from falling and to present you in what condition? What was but where? Before the presence of His glory. Where is that? That's in the most holy place. With exceeding joy, friends. You see, the second accusation, God, your law can't be kept, is refuted in the most holy place as Christ now imports to us His very own life. And then it says in the book, 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, write it down. Notice what it says, we're almost finished. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How can we have boldness in the day of judgment when there is an adversary that accuses us before God and has a perfect record of the sins that we've committed? How in the world can we stand in the judgment when we have such a mighty adversary? The answer we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is. Oh, tell me, friends. How is He? How is He? What else? He's perfect. What else? How is He? He's merciful. What else? He's just. What else? He's gracious. He's faithful. What else? He's love. He's pure. He's undefined. And the Bible actually says, as He is, so are we. Where? When He comes? In the world. Friends, you understand that the blood not only cleanses, but it changes. Amen. Amen. Some of us have habits have addictions. The good news tonight is the blood of Jesus can set you free, friends. You don't have to live as a slave to sin. You don't have to be a slave to your evil temper. You don't have to be a slave to watching things that are not good for your mind. You don't have to be a slave caring so much about what other people think of you or what God thinks of you. You can be free in Christ. You see, what Jesus does at the altar, at, at the cross, He justifies us legally. He forgives us. But in the most holy place, He perfects our faith. And He gives us His own life. And this is the reason why we can have boldness in the day of judgment. As He is, His blood or His life is applied to us, not just legally, but experimentally. What is in the most holy place that makes this practically possible? We've been talking lots about theology tonight, but what practically makes this possible? Tell me, friends, what was the blood sprinkled upon in the most holy place? It was sprinkled on the solid, solid slab of gold. It was called the mercy seat. And friends, that mercy seat was made of pure gold. Pure gold. What kind of gold? Pure gold. Do you know what gold represents in the Bible? It represents faith, according to 1 Peter 1 and verse 7. So that pure gold represents a pure faith. Friends, who is the only one that has a pure faith? Jesus. It is Jesus, friends. You see, that mercy seat represents Christ. Christ, the faith of Jesus. And friends, the only way that our lives can be brought in back in harmony to the law of God is by the faith and the works of Jesus. That and that alone, it's not something that we do, but it's something that we receive from Him as a gift. Can you see that? And God's people at the end have this gift. Why? Because they watch the Lamb and they follow the Lamb into the most holy place. They don't stop there at the altar of an offering. They don't stop at the cross. They follow Jesus all the way and they allow Jesus to perfect the faith. Notice what it says concerning them. Revelation 14 verse 12 describes the final generation that is about to go through a midnight crisis living through the passing of the National Sunday Law. Oh, we will not be able to buy or sell and persecution is going to be rekindled and it says that they are able to run the race and they're going to finish the race because they have patience or endurance. Remember what we need to finish the race? We need a patient faith. Where do we get it? 
in the most holy place. The solid slab of gold. Notice it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the what? Commandments of God. Where is that in the sanctuary? At the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place. But they not only keep the commandments of God, it says that they have the faith, not just in Jesus. The faith, what does it say? Of Jesus. In other words, they have been made righteous by faith. And because they have this experience, friends, Satan's accusations is silence. Remember the first accusation said that your justice does away with mercy. Christ proved that that wasn't true by God. His second accusation, your mercy does away with your justice. How is God going to prove that false? He's going to have a whole generation at the end of time who love Jesus so much. They follow Jesus to the most holy place. And they're going to be made righteous by the faith of Christ. Because of this, they have patience. They can endure the final crisis. And through them, Satan's accusations and silence. And God's mercy is established. His justice is established in our lives. You see, God's final generation have Jesus as the author and the finisher of their faith. Notice what it says in Desire of Ages 6, 71. The very image of God is to be what? Reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. This happens, friends, as we follow Jesus into the most holy place. And friends, it does not happen overnight. It happens as we continue to behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And as we behold, we become changed from glory to glory. Remember that? It's a process. And so don't feel bad if you see your inconsistencies and the sins of your life and your defects. You see, the closer we come to Jesus, the more sinful we will see ourselves, just like a mirror. And if there's a mirror in the back of the room, I see myself from this distance. I look all right, but as I get closer to the mirror, I see the defects of my life. That's the same with Christ, friends. And so this is a high standard, but you don't have to be discouraged. If you see yourself sinful and dirty, know that... That the fact that you recognize your condition shows that Jesus is drawing you closer and closer to Him. Can you see that? And friends, as we do this, you know what's going to happen? The latter rain is going to fall. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted means to be changed. And friends, where are we changed and perfected? In the most holy place. We're justified at the altar. We're forgiven and made right legally at the altar. But in the most holy place, we are changed experimentally. And friends, when this happens, that your sins may be blotted out. Not just legally from the records in heaven, but experimentally in our lives. Sin goes out as Jesus comes in. And then what happens? When the times of refreshing shall come from where? The presence of the Lord from the most holy place where the Shekinah presence is. The latter rain is going to fall with power upon God's people. And God is going to have a visible witness to all the world that he has a people that love him more than they love sin. A people that have been changed by his love. And then you know what happens? Remember Psalms 91 is a song for us at the end of time. He that dwells in the secret place from the most high are going to be protected by the plagues. But the last part of that chapter says in verse 13, Thou shalt tread upon the... Who's the lion? It is Satan, friends. Remember the lion's accusations? Your all can't be kept. It says that God's people is going to tread upon the lion and the adam. That's the snake, the serpent. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. Why is it that we can do this? Because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, in the most holy place. Can you see that? Amen. Friends, how can we have this most holy experience as we close? It all comes down to this, friends. Look up and lift up your heads. Look and live, friends. Watch the Lamb take away the sin of the world in the most holy place. And when you look up and you see the high priest, what do you see? You see that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come how? Boldly, let's read it, to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look up, and you see a high priest 
that can sympathize with your weakness. Can you say that? You have a friend before the throne that has walked in your shoes. He understands your pain. He sympathizes with our sorrows. And in this time of awful solemnity, we don't have to be discouraged or afraid of the judgment. Why? Because before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue on earth can bid me there depart. The key, friends, is to look up, to watch the Lamb, watch him one of the night. Don't just look at the night, look at the morning, look at the Lamb, the bright and morning star. Why? Because when we look at ourselves, we don't see how we can be saved. But when we look at Jesus, we don't see how we can be lost. Amen. When we look at when you look at yourself, you see all these inconsistencies, these defects, and you think, oh, I'm not supposed to give up. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at us. Watch the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God. It's the gaze glass principle. God is calling us to do, friends. He's calling us to gaze upon Him and glance upon ourselves. But many times we gaze on ourselves and we just glance at Him. We need to gaze on Him, glance at ourselves every now and then to see how we're doing. Glance at ourselves in self-examination. But after that, don't keep your eyes on yourself. Look up for our redemption. Draws nigh. While our high priest ministers above, let us allow him to perfect our faith by a full surrender. And then we can claim this most precious promise, which is what we close with tonight. Most precious promise. Let's read it together. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, Be confident of this very faith, that he who has begun a good work in you will to the day of Jesus Christ. How many of you want this promise to be your experience in your life? Friends, you can know the signs and still be lost. But if you know the Savior, you can be saved. How many of you, as we close tonight, want to say, Lord, help me to watch the Lamb that I might have a most holy experience in the last days. Is that your prayer, friends? If so, I invite you to go to your knees with me as we close tonight. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this exciting good news message. The message that tells us that what you have begun, you are able to finish. Father, many times we begin things and we don't finish it. But thank you, Lord, that when you start something, you're able to see it all the way through. And we pray that, that this would be the case with us. Lord, you've stirred our hearts. You've begun a good work in us. We've come to the altar of your cross. We've accepted the, shed, the blood that was shed. Thank you, Lord, that in your sight we have a legal right to your, to your mercy. And that Satan's accusations have no power because your blood speaks louder than all of his accusations. But Lord, we pray that you would not only justify us legally, but that you would transform and sanctify us experimentally. Help us to follow the Lamb all the way to the most holy place. Help us to watch you, Lord. And as you cleanse the record of sin in the sanctuary above, would you please cleanse these earthly temples here on earth. Cleanse our hearts. Cleanse our minds. Bring our lives back into harmony with your perfect will. Lord, we know that it's not something that we do, but it's something that we allow you to do in us. So tonight we give you permission. Have your own way, Lord. Have your own way. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for...
gazing at ourselves and only glancing at you. Help us now, Lord, to turn our eyes upward, to look at you. And as we behold, change us. Make us what you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to abide in the secret place of the Most High, under your wings, where there's safety, security, satisfaction, and salvation. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen.